Okay. See if I can get my PowerPoint to work here. Terrific. All right. Wow. Okay. This is actually our first hybrid event, basically live at the Fuge and uh, and we have online. So I'd like to, whoops, like to welcome everybody this evening. Whoops, hold on here. No, it should be on. Can, I, people said they could hear us, so um, so it shouldn't be a problem. Yep, and we're getting the thumbs up, so that's good. I'm just off camera, though. Um, so good evening, everybody. And I'm really thrilled to have a, a great turnout here at the Fuge and online this evening. Um, my name is Eleanor Rangers. I'm the president of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Cold War Historical Society. And we are delighted to have a very interesting, a little bit different type of presentation this evening uh, for our guest speaker who we'll introduce momentarily. But as usual, I do have a couple of announcements um, to make as well. So this is, of course, our History in Our Backyard webinar series. Although it's also lecture and webinar series this evening since we're since we're live as well here in Warminster. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Fuge, um, which uh, has graciously uh, allowed us the use of this um, of this room this evening. Um, so we very much appreciate their generosity and their support for our organization over the years. Um, this uh, event is in the lab. Uh, as they call it. And uh, again, it's also online this evening and it is being recorded. Um, for any of you live who require a restroom, they are located, if you exit the lab, turn left, uh, they are located on the right prior to the main circular corridor. So if you hit the marble circular corridor, you've gone too far, turn around um, and you'll see the restrooms um, right behind you. Um, I also, I think a couple of you have taken advantage before this event this evening um, of the fact that the Fuge now has its own uh, brewery uh, known as Tranquility Brewing Company. Um, and if you have an opportunity, you should definitely check them out. Um, they brew their own beer. And I guess what tonight is the, uh, is it the Dallas Eagles game tonight? Is that right? So yeah, yeah, the Eagles game. Um, so, <laughs> so um, if you want to uh, check out the game after the program this evening uh, and grab a beer, uh, I certainly would encourage you to do that. Also, I do want to mention, being that we are a nonprofit organization, we do certainly benefit from the generosity of those of you who choose to uh, donate to our organization. So, um, you know, very easy way to do that. Um, we have a donation button online on our website, or you can always give, you know, mail a uh, mail a donation to us, um, or give something uh, live. I would like to thank the individual who <laughs> gave us a donation this evening. So thank you. And it does, you know, these do go towards helping to defray costs for people that come live, you know, as as um, speakers from out of town. And we do have other um, needs from an archival perspective that we're still certainly seeking um, funds for. So it does get put to good use and all of the, any donations go directly to the activities of our organization. I mean, I don't pull a salary or any volunteers. So just to let you know. Um, one of the things that your donations do go to is actually a display room uh, that is in the process of being developed, basically dedicated to preserving Naval Air Development Center history. This is in development. It's actually going to be right off the front entrance to the Fuge. Um, I'll be working on it tomorrow, actually. And if there are any, any people interested in helping us with putting artifacts in there and so forth, uh, please uh, reach out. Um, but we are in the process of finally assembling that. Uh, and we're hoping to have a formal dedication of it coming up in the very near future. We also archive these presentations on our YouTube channel, which is under our name. If you haven't been there, you might want to check it out. Um, so in addition to the webinars, we also have other uh, Cold War related and Naval Air Development Center um, information um, on there as well. So definitely would encourage you to look at that. And, you know, I do try to keep it updated uh, pretty regularly. Um, we also have a Facebook page. If any of you are on Facebook, definitely check us out. Um, it's on a slightly different name, Southeast PA. So the abbreviation for Pennsylvania, not the full spell out of Pennsylvania, uh, if you're looking for us on there. 
Uh, and, you know, I do try to also keep our programming announcements updated on there as well as other Cold War related uh, information on there that may be of interest. Um, I believe we do automatically mute anyone that is online, but um, when we have Q&A at the conclusion of the program, you will be able to unmute yourself. And I will, I also ask if you could turn your cameras off as well, that helps to preserve bandwidth um, so everyone can hear the presentation. So thank you for your help with that. Um, do you wanna also mention, we are actually rounding out our year with our webinar. This evening, of course, is uh, Franz Bond's presentation. We do have Chuck Phillips and other NADC alumnus who will be speaking in October. Um, and then I'm still in the planning stages of some type of veterans tribute event uh, that will be live here at the Fuge. So more information on that to come. And then we'll be rounding out the year in December with David Stumpf returning to talk about uh, Minuteman missile vulnerability. Um, for those of you who have been regular participants in these webinars, you've heard David speak a number of times um, on uh, various missile systems. So we're definitely looking forward to that. And I am in the process of planning for 2024 programming um, as we speak. So um, I think you'll be excited with some stuff I have planned uh, for next year. Hopefully um, some live events um, as well. Um, one other thing that we had started to do just prior to the pandemic was we wanted to start doing periodic movie nights. Um, and we started out with Bridge of Spies. For those of you who might remember, we had Gary Powers Jr. come as a discussant at the conclusion of that program of that movie. But um, actually, I'm planning another movie night with the movie X-15. <laughs> and um, I, I love the ad, actually filmed in space. But um, actually, what we're planning on doing is having a viewing here. And then uh, we're going, whoops, we're going to have um, Michelle Evans actually uh, do a live Zoom Q&A with us. Um, Michelle actually was here in 2019 uh, to discuss the X-15 program. She's a walking encyclopedia of everything related to the history of the X-15 program. So there's no one better to really do that. So look, uh, you know, look, basically stay tuned for when um, I'm gonna schedule that um, event. We mentioned about Chuck Phillips in October. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our guest speaker who is on, um, you might be able to see him in the webinar uh, live feed from here. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and introduce our speaker, Franz Bonn. Upon graduating from Drexel Institute of Technology in 1965, Franz Bonn had a 50 plus year professional career that spanned employment with the FAA, the Naval Air Development Center and numerous DOD contractors, as well as a self-employed consultant. He lived through a series of unique life-altering events, beginning with a traumatic childhood in war-torn Yugoslavia and extended an austere refugee life in Austria and life-impacting experiences in the U.S. as an immigrant. He's been married to his wife, Barbara, for 58 years, has two sons and daughters, daughters-in-law and six amazing grandchildren. Although now retired from soccer, he was very active at all levels of the sport as a player, coach, club president, and referee. So with that, I am going to exit my presentation and turn things over to Franz Bond. So welcome. This crowd is amazing. I expected maybe 15, 16 people. So thank you very much for coming out, especially on an Eagles night. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. How about the people in the cheap seats? Doing the okay? Great. If 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 I start fading out, please just raise your hand. And uh, we'll have a second collection about halfway through. That's for my benefit, okay? <laughs> Uh, what, you know, what you usually have here uh, in these presentations are historical events of great defense uh, actions, uh, programs, the X-15 is coming up. Uh, so what we have today here is a slight departure from that. To kind of end up with my career at the Naval Air Development Center. And uh, as Eleanor said, I've spent 30 some years actually working here and my heart breaks that it's, it's actually closed. I wish it was still open. But uh, we, uh, we are going to depart from that normal mode and talk to you a little bit about the inside viewpoint of what happens in a war. 
what happens to people? How are their futures uh, shaped by that? Uh, most of most of you and most of most of American people, in terms of actual war experience, except for soldiers who have uh, defended the country, really don't have a good appreciation for what it means to have war in the country, war at your doorstep, and what it does to you. And and that's what I hope to maybe pass along to you a little bit. I'm fortunate. I made it through it. A lot of people in my generation, a lot of people who had the same life path as I did, did not make it. So I'm, I'm fortunate to be here and be able to tell you about it. I'm also in that last generation of people that have lived through World War II. And the adults that lived through World War II are gone. So now we have the children that lived through it, including me, the ones that are left. And one of the reasons I wanted to pass the story along is as time goes on, our numbers are, are dwindling also. So I hope I'm giving you a, a unique viewpoint here. Uh, th the story is about escaping ethnic cleansing and we'll go through the definition of ethnic cleansing and it ends up with the work uh, experience that I've had here at, at the Naval Air Development Center. Okay, Eleanor. Okay, Be before I actually get into a lot of the detail, uh, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have cameras around our necks. So a lot of the things that you'll see here are, I've gotten through research, I've gotten through uh, public sources, and they're not necessarily pictures of my actual experience, but they are pictures that uh, depict what we went through, what what it was like. So you. There is a lot of pictures here, and I think pictures are a better way of telling stories. So keep that in mind. And I, I also want to thank the uh, Dona Schwaben Village Helping Hands Organization, uh, a great organization that talks about the, the, the people that I'm going to present to you and has a tremendous amount of information. They have a, a web page. And I want to thank them for allowing me to use some of their information. Go ahead. Believe it or not, I was classified by the United States as a former enemy. In 1952, when I came into this country, that was my card. I was an enemy, an identified ex-enemy. And through fate, through a lot of, uh, of uh, proper things happening, in 1959, I became an American citizen, and it was one of the proudest moments of my life. It was a tremendous uh, accomplishment for me, looking at where I ended up versus where I began. By the way, I also had a lot more hair back then. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to the, to the, this evening, I'm going to talk a lot about Swabians. Now, most people don't know what Swabians are. They're basically German-speaking people <laughs> that have a unique culture, a somewhat unique German language, and they originated in uh, an area called Swabia in, in Germany. Go ahead. The map may not be too easy to see, but the red parts are areas in Germany where most of uh, the uh, Swabian people came from. Uh, the two main areas are Swa Swabia. Uh, it's, it's not called that now anymore, but it was Swabia and uh, Alsace-Lorraine. My actual family came from Alsace-Lorraine back in the 1700, late 1700s. Now, what they did is they moved from those red areas, and what you see in the blue line there is the Danube. Danube, obviously a very large river in Europe. And the combination of the area where we originated, which was Swabia, and Danube is the uh, 
basis for the name that I'm going to use a lot tonight, which is a, a, a people called Dona Schwaben. I know that's awkward, but it's also Dan Danube Swabian. It's the people that came from that area of Germany, used the, the uh, Danube River to get down into an area that used to be called Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore, but it used to be Yugoslavia, and that's that dark area. By the way, Yugoslavia is spelled both with a Y in most English-speaking countries and with a J in, in, uh, in Germany and, and uh, European countries. Okay. The Swabians migrated in three waves. They're very similar to our people, the American people that, you know, the Oregon trails that moved out west, uh, very similar concept. The first migration was in the early 1700s. Second migration was in the later 1700s. That's where my family originated in the late 1700s. And the reason I'm going, I'm concentrating on the date because it's very germane to the story I'm going to tell you. And the third migration happened in the late 1700s, actually went close to, into the 1800s. And those are the numbers, 20,000 in the first, 50,000, 45,000. And it doesn't sound a lot when you think that there are 6 million illegal aliens coming in now. But back then, that was a tremendous amount of people that moved from Swabia, from Alsace-Lorraine, into the area of Yugoslavia. And what they did is they came on these boats. My grandfather used to talk about his grandfather building a boat like that. And this is how they, they, they put 50, 60 people on these boats and they drifted down the Danube River and they wound up in Yugoslavia. Go ahead. In 1940, which is really the very beginning of the, of the war situation in Yugoslavia, there's about 500,000, it's closer to 550,000 Dona Schwaben people in Yugoslavia. My family was among those. And keep that number in mind because right now, there's probably less than a thousand Dona Schwaben living in that area, which is not called Yugoslavia anymore. Go ahead. Just a little bit of, to to get you set, because we lived in a in a in a in a comfort zone, just like all of you are in a comfort zone. My father, my mother, that little guy's me. 1941, I had devilish eyes even back then. 1943, right before things really got rotten, I was, I was two and a half years old. And this is a picture of the house we lived in. And we were not at the top of the social level. We were relatively, you know, at the lower level. And we lived a lifestyle, the Amish, if you're familiar with the Amish in Lancaster County, the Amish lived a life very similar to the way we lived. Next, please. I'm going to just give you a, a, a quick snapshot of the origin. That those are the typical homes that were built, thatched roofs, simple construction. Next, please. We had churches, we had schools. That particular church is where my, my mother was, uh, uh, actually she went to school there in the school right next to the church. And the Germans had a very, very rural and organized lifestyle in those towns. They were German. They were not anything but a, a Germanic uh, culture. They had thrashing machines. They, they tended to the fields. My mother was a maid. She went to fifth grade. After fifth grade, you went to work. 
and you gave 90% of your salary to your dad. So usually your dad wasn't too happy when you got married. And that was the case in our case. But she was a maid and she worked as a maid until we left Yugoslavia. My dad, you know, you, you hear jokes about people going to college to become basket weavers. Well, my dad was a basket weaver, but it was a very honorable profession back then. He built not only baskets, but they built uh, furniture, different implementations. It's amazing what they could do with reeds, with, with, with that uh, uh, artistry. Go ahead. My grandfather was a barrel maker. And in addition, of course, to tending to the fields, people didn't just concentrate on one, on, on one profession. They did a lot of things. And his, his specialty was making barrels. And my mother went to school, as I mentioned up there. She, uh, I circled her with her there. Um, my father went to seventh grade. And then he had to get into an apprenticeship to become the, the uh, basket weaver. And that, that kind of gives you the beginnings. You know, when I look at it, I got a master's degree. And when I look at the beginnings of my parents, and I look at the, the tremendous difference in, in their opportunities versus the opportunities that I was able to take advantage of, it's, it's really, you know, it's eye-opening to the difference in just a matter of 30 years. Oh, great, yeah. I'll try not to blind anybody. Okay. Okay, you've, you've all heard of ethnic cleansing. There's a, a, go ahead. There's a written definition of it, and I'm gonna cut through the ball. Ethnic cleansing is a cruel way of treating people that you don't like, whether it is their color, whether it is their nationality, it doesn't matter. The basis of ethnic cleansing is we want to get rid of you. If you've got blonde hair and we don't like blonde hair, you're done. And the range of being done is the cool part of it. Okay. So to, to, to kind of bring it home a little bit, because I know most of you are familiar with the unfortunate incident in, in this country where during World War II, the Japanese uh, people were interned after the uh, attack on, on uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, about 140,000 people, most of them out of the West Coast, were interned in camps, usually in the desert, usually in Arizona. They were locked up. They were taken out of their houses. The kids had to go with them. And just imagine if we had really gone crazy. That's the first stage of ethnic cleansing. But if, if it had not been controlled, imagine people having been put to slave camps, people having been tortured, people having been beaten, and people having been killed. So it gives you an idea and I'm going to go into this with the Yugoslavian case. It's never too far away. It sounds like an abstract thing. It can't happen here. Yes, it can. And the Japanese sad situation, although it happened back in 1940, 41, it is, it is an indication of how close to home things really can come. Go ahead. In Yugoslavia, that special group, I talked about blonde people. In Yugoslavia, the crime was if you spoke German. It didn't matter how long you had been in Yugoslavia. My people had been in Yugoslavia close to 200 years, 150 to 200 years. It didn't matter. If you spoke German after the Germans uh, did the war and, and moved to the East, you became an outcast. And that was the basis for 
the ethnic cleansing that I'm going to be talking about. And, and the, the key behind all of that is the, the, the trigger point. It, and and I, I, I get a big kick nowadays when I hear politicians talking about emergency situations. It sends shivers down my spine because an emergency situation is also when you're called a war criminal. All of a sudden, it gives you free hand to do to people that you don't, that you don't want that you want to cleanse. Go ahead. At the end of the second war, near the end of the second world war, and, and the Germans have started retreating, uh, uh, going west. The Soviet army was advancing. Things looked very dire for people in Yugoslavia. And not just the German people, by the way. It, the, the Soviet army was known for its brutality, was known that once they were able to get revenge, there was all kinds of bad things happening. What they did, the people that remained in Yugoslavia that didn't take advantage of what I'm going to talk about in a minute, there were the, the, Dona Schwaben people who stayed in Yugoslavia, who had an opportunity to leave like we did, they were rounded up. And this is typically what happened in the town. They would grab you out of your house. They would tell you to go down in, into a, a local school area, a local church, and there'd be 100, 200, 300 people there. First thing they did is to separate men from the women. When women fared very poorly. On the men's side, they took the able-bodied people and they sent them to slave camps, to work camps. Worked them to death. Didn't feed them much. Just enough so they could work. When you got sick, what they did is they figured you were expendable and either let you die naturally or they shot you. It wasn't just the Soviets. I've done a lot of research on this. Tito, who was the head of the Yugoslavian country, had used what were called the partisans to uh, fight the Germans while the Germans were in Yugoslavia. They were kind of a resistance group. Well, once the German army started retreating, Tito kind of let the partisans free. And they became very brutal, no discipline. It's unimaginable how cruel they became. They, they not only worked with the Soviets in, in uh, running the slave camps, but they systematically, and I'm talking about the Danube Swabian people, they systematically killed hundreds upon hundreds of people. And one of their normal routes was, in the middle of the night, they would rustle up 10, 10 men, told them to go out in the woods, and dig a long trench. They would dig eight, nine hours. And when they were di done digging the trench, they would shoot them. Would shoot them so they would fall into the trench, grabbed another 10 people, took them to the trench, told them to throw dirt on those bodies, and then they shot them. That was a, a, a normal occurrence. The brutality is unimaginable. There was no feelings there. We're just pure hatred. And this is the type of problem that we were able to escape. Go ahead. They had liquidation camps. These were hard, hard labor camps. And I, I have them identified in, in red dots throughout what was formerly Yugoslavia. And that's where the accident that I just talked about happened. There were eight major camps in Yugoslavia and 
you can read stories online about these and that's heartbreaking uh, what happened in, in, in those camps. Go ahead. So again, the, the, the biggest problem we had is not that we were bad people. I'm talking about the Danisuevians. Not that we were bad people. Not that we were against the government. In actuality, a lot of the Donish Schwaben actually served in the Yugoslavian army. And when the Germans came, they had no choice. They were drafted into the German army. And that only caused the partisans to hate them even more. So it, it was a cycle of hatred that was generated against all things German. All in all, we're talking about areas now outside of Yugoslavia, 1.6 million people were uprooted from their homes, deported, enslaved, killed, solely, solely because they were German. Go ahead. The Yalta Conference, which happened before the war ended, was basically a conference that said, okay, the people that got affected by the Germans during the war, you deserve reparations. And the reparations, a lot of it was take over property, take over the land that Germans owned and uh, put people into uh, labor camps, let them work off the debt to, to us. So reparations, keep that in mind, we're hearing that a little bit. Reparations was the cover word on, on the Yalta Conference. Franklin D. Roosevelt went to that. Unfortunately, he died. Uh, and the second conference that we had was, go ahead, May uh, in 1945, the war ended. Go ahead. And then we had the second conference, which was the uh, Potsdam Conference. Uh, that one was attended by Truman. And there you can see where there was supposed to have been this, this international agreement to remove ethnic Germans from, uh, from the, the Baltic states. And basically uh, do it in a humane manner, an orderly and humane manner. And you, 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 could not speak a bigger lie than that, because what happened was anything but that. Right. So the, 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 the Potsdam Conference was basically the legal, the legal cover for the ugliness that happened. Fifteen in total, and we're talking about the countries like Romania, Hungary, Yugoslavia, uh, 15 million ethnic Germans were affected and five millions of those are classified as the, the Danube Swabians. And unfortunately the map isn't too clear. I thought we were gonna have a slightly bigger screen, but you can see the flow of people based on the Potsdam Conference of the countries I mentioned, including Czechoslovakia, they all were supposed to, remember this was theoretical, they were all supposed to move to Germany proper. October 44 was the magic date. Now, already in October 44, this was before the war ended, but the Germans were retreating. October 44 was acknowledged by most uh, Danube Swabians that you had to leave your home. You, you, you had to leave your possessions, couldn't leave anything. You had to get out. They had two ways of going. One was by rail, uh, which was the women and children. The other one was um, by wagon. Okay? And that was mostly the older men. 
if you didn't leave on when you were told to leave, that's what happened. They shot you. There was no questions I asked. Just came and shot you. Before the war, there was 500, as I mentioned before, there was 500,000 uh, Danish Arabians. 250 of us fled. We were able to get to Austria. We were able to get to parts of, of, of um, Germany. But you see what happened. Of the 250 that remained, 12,000 were killed by the Parsons right away. 170,000 were interned in labor camps and worked to death. And a lot of them were deported to Soviet uh, slave camps in Siberia. And there, there's no worse place to go than Siberia in terms of labor conditions. Now, this is the heartbreaking part. During that turmoil, a lot of Donishwaben children, mostly under 14, were taken from their parents, were transferred to uh, Serbian, which was the Yugoslavia. Ser Yugoslavia had mostly Serbs at that time, uh, some Croats, uh, were given to the Serbs and they were transformed into Serbian citizens. So parents lost their children and the children actually lost their nationality. So if I had stayed, my whole future would be totally different than it turned out. Uh, that's how communism works. Now, the, it, the people that were expelled, this gives you an idea. They're carrying their life's, their life's belongings that they were able to carry with them. Uh, horse wagons, terrible conditions, horrible weather, uh, and they were also usually attacked. They were not given carte blanche free. There, there were a lot of partisans that interrupted those journeys and, and, and stole things, the, the meager belongings they had. A lot of times they ripped earrings out of women's ears. There was no, no handing over anything. It was brutal. You know? In my case, my mom and I, my grandfather, we uh, escaped using uh, boxcars. An interesting story is we, you know, in October 18th, we were still in our homes. We knew things were, were really bad, but the way we, what, the, the way we experienced is we heard shots. We had a beautiful German Shepherd, like most, most people had guard dogs. Dog barked once and he was shot. And people came in, about 20 partisans, armed to the teeth, screaming at the top of their lungs, get out. And before we, before we even knew what was happening, they carried stuff out of our house. They roughed up my grandfather. We had no choice. You just don't, imagine 20 people showing up at your house telling you to get out and they're armed and you're not. You just have no alternative. So this is typically, uh, I'm, I'm gonna take questions later on. There, it, typically, this is the wagon we had. <laughs> the interesting thing is we went to the train station, which was about two miles from the home at night, pitch black. And when we got to the train station, the town next to our train station got bombed and that no trains were running. So we had no trains access. Believe it or not, we, we went back to our house because there was no choice. And on the way back, my mom lost her shoe. I stepped on a, on a corn stalk and had a gash in my leg. And we cowered in that house for four or five hours. It was cleaned out. Everything was gone. Dead dog was in lawn. And the next day we went back and we were able to get on a car like this, 50 people to a car and their meager belongings. Go ahead. 
gives you, again, you can see the access to the trains for older people is hard. I really relate to this picture because this basically could have been me. This basically could have been my grandfather. Uh, you had 50 people in a car, no heat. When it was dark, there was no light. You slept on the floor. There was heavy steel rolling doors that sometimes opened on their own. And you couldn't have imagined a worse life. No restroom, obviously. Uh, in our particular car, my grandfather and one of the other men actually cut a hole in the corner of the box car so it could be used as a toilet. Bombing attacks were a constant threat. Uh, the fact that we were civilians in boxcars had, had, had made no difference. Go ahead. You can see the effect of the bombings. That's pretty typical of what happened. Trains used to be stuck for days. A trip that normally takes three hours from my hometown in Yugoslavia to Austria, we were 12 days on a train, 12 days. During the bombings, believe it or not, when the, when the train stopped, we had to get out. And oftentimes, this is where we went to. Straw huts in the field, obviously they don't pro provide any protection, but it was better than being out in the open. When we got to Austria, life got a little better. There was no food on, on these trains. When we stopped, we usually had look for chestnuts, duck for potatoes, anything. We were starving. This was typically in Austria where people finally gave you a loaf of bread that would be shared among 30, 40 people. Typical DP camps, DP stands for displaced persons. Uh, this is typically throughout Austria and Germany where the Dona Schwaben people uh, wound up. Next, please. And in my case, eventually we wound up in a place near Salzburg. You put mo mostly know Salzburg as the place of the sound of music, but we wound up in a camp of seven barracks. These were World War I Russian POW barracks. They, were at, they had been abandoned, they had been vandalized, there was no heat, no electricity, uh, no septic system, but it was home. It was better than the train, it was better than a boxcar. You can see the conditions. Uh, lice were a, a common thing. For a long time, I didn't know what life was like without lice because they were so common. Bed bugs. Some of those suckers were bigger than uh, cockroaches. They, you know, they had free reign because there was no, no fumigation, no insecticides, uh, insecticides, whatever. This is typically how we slept for the first three months in camp. Uh, straw, about 40 people to, uh, to an area. The barracks, basically were one long hallway with a, uh, a, a toilet facility at the, the end that didn't work, but it was at the end. And on both sides, there were rooms that had about 40, 50 people. And those rooms, people were there. there. There was no separation. There was no privacy. There was no, there was no nothing you had a straw area to, to, to rest in. And, you know, if people burped at one end, they heard it at the other end. Um, you know, people passed gas at one end, at the other end. It was our, our, our form of Wi-Fi. You know, you, you, you got used to all those things that you don't think of in crowded conditions like that. You know. and, and by the way, believe it or not, those barracks were my reason, my introduction to becoming an electrical engineer. We, we finally got electricity about a year after we moved in and the fuses kept blowing. 
And the way they were fixed is we had a guy come in with a piece of wire and he put it around the fuse and screwed it back in and got the lights back on. And I just thought that was so great. And I always look back at that. And I think that is really what I got interested in electricity. This is something I hope none of you, your children, your grandchildren ever experience. Hunger, the worst part of hunger is not knowing when it's going to end. You know, I, I, I get a big kick out of hearing kids when they complain they had to wait an hour for their Big Mac or their, you know, their, their, their hot dog was late. Well, try not eating for six days and not even knowing when you're going to have food on the seventh or the eighth or the ninth. There's a mental aspect to hunger that's more cruel than the physical part. And I lived through that. And, and I, I, I just am so glad my children, my grandchildren, and I hope all of, all of your uh, uh, children and grandchildren will never experience that. That's the worst aspect of, of a war. Go ahead. The way we survived first couple of years, digging for potatoes. Uh, in 1980, I was over in Austria, and I actually looked at the field where we dug for potatoes. And uh, it was quite emotional, as a matter of fact. We didn't have tools, and we were only allowed to dig at night. The farmers did not allow us on the field in the daytime. So we had to go out at night, no tools, usually in cold weather, and we had to look for potatoes that the farmer missed. And that's how we existed for many, many months. We also had we had permission to go and find fallen fruit, we, obviously mushrooms, chestnuts, berries. Those are the type of things. We shot rabbits uh, by shooting, I'm talking slingshot. We didn't have guns, slingshot. Uh, pigeons, disgusting animals, right? Get hungry. All of a sudden, they're really good. And then later on, we uh, finally had a soup kitchen that was established. Go ahead, Ellen. I want to tell you a little story about something that you you probably never even think of, but in World War II, after the war, there were no computers, the record keeping was very poor, and it was difficult to find a lot of your relatives. So in our camp, we had one, one woman whose husband had not been heard of for three years. She had two children. And she finally, legally, got her husband declared dead. The most heartbreaking thing that I think I've ever lived through was I was sitting on the steps in front of my barracks, and I saw a man in torn clothing walking down to barrack number two. And it was that woman's husband. Unfortunately, the reason the woman had him declared dead is she remarried. So just imagine, just imagine having gone through all that hell, finally feeling like you're, you're free, you can rejoin your family. And the poor man, after an hour in barrack number two, walked out crying like a baby. Those are the type of things you never hear of. Those are the type of things that happen a lot. Mm -hmm. Camp, now, you know, like everything else, when you have a bunch of people together, society starts functioning. As bad as it was, we had a camp leader, we had the United, United Nations Relief uh, Association, International Relief Organization, we established a working soup kitchen, handymen were all over the place, we actually built uh, cooking stoves from war scrap metal. Some of them were Jeep parts where, you know, things got bombed. They formed uh, stoves, so we were finally able to cook. Soccer, you know, <laughs> soccer was uh, the lifeblood of, of the youth there. And we actually, I'm so proud of this, we actually formed 
a soccer team that was the basis for the existing professional soccer team in in uh, in that town in 1948. That's their history. And that's our class. We had school. We had school. Uh, so we we got civilized again. I mean, we 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 picked ourselves up from the bootstraps, and we were able to function as society. Go ahead. As I mentioned, the uh, international support. You slowly were able to get milk, and I'm talking 46, 47. Milk and butter could uh, be bought nearby. Occasionally, we got spam from the armies. Armies was our nickname for American soldiers, and it was a dear term. We loved the armies. We hated the Ruskies. There was a difference in behavior, and we were in the American sector, so we were very fortunate. Spam was great. I still love spam. We raised chickens, ducks, sheep, pigs, uh, and of course, like everything else, to really exist, you got to make money. So we had people who, who got jobs in the surrounding areas, usually menial labor jobs, but it was it was a paycheck. We we had uh, pigs we raised. Uh, Slaughtered uh, schlockfest. We 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 slaughtered, and finally had meat. You know, this is something we didn't have for a year and a half. Meat is so important. If you don't appreciate it, except for you veggies, if you don't appreciate meat, go without it for a few days. Go ahead. In 1948, we finally had a semblance of normalcy. We had social clubs. We actually had. Uh, let's see. We had a wedding. Uh, that's my uh, first confirmation. Schools, uh, and of course our soccer team. So to get back to some semblance of normalcy was very important to us. Okay. We were also able to get assimilated into the Austrian uh, society and what helped us, and it took a while by the way, the Austrians were overrun with refugees. That poor country has absorbed more refugees per capita than probably any country in the world. You had the Second World War, you had the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, you had the uh, Czesos Czechoslovakian uh, uprising. They all came to Austria. So there, it wasn't a welcome you all type of Austrian society. But we were able over the long haul because of our common language, because of our work ethic, to slowly become accepted. And a lot of people who stayed are now are, are actual Austrian citizens. Emigration. It sounds so great. You leave one country, you go to the next. Now here is, here's a, 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 a group of people that have just lost their home. They have just lost everything they've had. And they have another big trip ahead of them to another country where it's unknown, where you have nothing. And that's what a lot of people are facing. And my mother, bless her heart, decided that she was going to emigrate to the United States. I would say in my lifetime, that's the best decision that a person could have made for my life. But it also meant more family separation. We left our uncles there. I left my grandfather there, and I'll tell you a little quick story about that. We left our support system. We emigrated, and the normal reason for emigration is a search for better life. In my case, it was in search of better health. For every winter in Austria, I developed a severe case of pneumonia, and twice I nearly died. And my mother had decided that if we stayed there, I wouldn't last another three, four years. So she decided to emigrate to the United States with me. She would leave her family back there, and we moved to the United States, and it's helped. My health has, has been much better. The heartbreak I was mentioning was, and real quick, I don't know, how many of you are, are fathers or grandfathers? Two days before I left, Austria, 
my grandfather, who lived in a different town, came for a final visit. And here's a man, I had not mentioned it, but my father died in the war. Here's a man who lost his son. Here's a man who lost his, all of his belongings. He lost his wife to illness due to the war. Here's a man who had gone probably through hell like no one else should have gone through. And he was going to lose his grandson. Back in 1952, a trip to the United States was a one-way deal. I've been back a few times since then, but not in 1952. Back then, it was a one-way, especially for older people. And that man, when he finally came, he gave me a hug like I've never experienced before, and he wept profusely. And I wore a jacket at that time. And because of that experience, those tears are still on that jacket. And whenever one of my grandkids turns that age, the age that I came to this country, I put that jacket on the kids and I told them that story. It was an emotional moment. And unfortunately, it was the last time I did see my grandfather. But can you just imagine can you imagine the feeling? I can't. I can't imagine. Well, one of my grandsons here. I can't imagine not seeing him ever again after today. Can you imagine what that person went through? The, the Displaced Persons Act is, is uh, the, the act uh, for, which allowed us to come. Initially, they authorized 200,000. Eventually, it was increased to 450,000 under President Truman. Go ahead. Here's the difference between the old immigration and the immigration we have now, okay? You had to have a sponsor. And by the way, you had to have a lot of shots. And oh, were those needles thick. Oh, they hurt. But you had to have them because you weren't going to come in here if you didn't get those shots. So you had to have a sponsor. You had to have a place to live. You were gu guaranteed that you're not going to take an American job. That was a, you got to guarantee that. Go ahead. This is the cruise ship I came on. And you know what? It was the greatest sight in the world. It was a 12 day journey, two storms. My mother was sick during that trip and I saw her two times. And I had to stay with the men because Kids over 10 years old weren't allowed to be in the women's quarters. So I stayed with men. And for, except those two times that I saw my mom, that was the trip. By the way, that's the jacket. Okay. Boy, I had good looking hair. <laughs> and when we got to Ellis Island, and I loved Ellis Island, we visited Ellis Island about 10 years ago. This is typically of the reaction. You get, and you got shot full of DDT. And I remember that chilling feeling. They pumped this thing down your shirt, down your pants, in your shoes. You were, you were lice free. But they, they made sure that you were healthy. And if you were not healthy, they would send you back. There was no, you know, come on in, come on in, come in. No, no, they took care of business. Go ahead. And I still have a copy of the ship's manifest with my mother and my name on it. It's a treasure of mine. Okay. Now, learning English. You come to the country, I'm, in, I'm, I, I'm a country boy. I've lived in the country all my life. I got moved into the city, in, in, into a steel, steel and concrete jungle. How do you learn language? Well, you have friends. Of course, you have school, but I didn't go to school. I, I arrived on May 24th. I didn't go to school until September. By that time, I spoke English. School, friends, yes, comic books. I've talked to so many refugees. Go ahead. This is how I learned English. And the amazing thing is how effective it was. You were able to relate thoughts and pictures 
you let your imagination run. We didn't have an iPhone. We didn't have a translate program. That was our translate program. I wish I would have kept those comics. I'd be rich by now. <laughs> Go ahead. I went through a public school system, did not go to Catholic school. Or um, I was fortunate to go to Drexel. I uh, went to Drexel because I, I wanted to become an engineer and because I, I, uh, I, I had an opportunity to work six months out of the year through their co-op program. Now, during the regular student year, I had a full-time job. I worked in a machine shop. I also worked in a grocery store. And my grades showed it. If you remember Drexel at that time, I don't know about now, but at that time, it was a tough school. And uh, if, if you didn't spend the time studying, you, you plunked out. So I was fortunate to make it through Drexel, even though I had to work my way. My parents couldn't afford to pay my bill. I was lucky enough to have the government pay for my master's degree through work. I started work at the FAA as a co-op student, FAA in Atlantic City. As a co-op student, I worked there for two years. I eventually wound up. Go ahead. Eventually wound up in um, at the at Naval Air Development Center here. I'm married in 1965. I've got two great sons, families, and as mentioned before, the six children that which are just the the pride of my life. You 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 are here. You are on this center, and the centrifuge is right over here. This is where we are now. We uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I, I, I spent 32 years here, and uh, it's the best job I have ever could have imagined. Uh, and, and I think if the center was still open, I think I'd still be here. Go ahead. And not to bore you with a lot of government uh, acronyms, uh, I worked on some major programs. And the thing I'm most proud about is most of those programs helped us win the Cold War. I think a lot of you are here will agree. We lived through the golden age of DOD. We did some fine work on the center. And uh, I was fortunate enough, probably more luck than smarts, to be heading a lot of those programs. This is a picture of just some of the some of the events to show you the, some of the scientific complexities, and I've got over I've got over two thousand hours of flight time in Navy airplanes, and and FAA airplanes. Uh, so when my sons sometimes wonder why I don't like to fly anymore, I tell them I've done my I've done my time. Again, I still wish, you know, I wish I could grow that hair back. Go ahead. I tried retirement in 1997. That lasted about two weeks. And I, then I changed my mind and I worked through several companies. Uh, and the last one I worked for 10 years, there's several NAVMAR people here uh, where I spent 10 years and I retired uh, in 2015. Go ahead. Now, just in, in, in summary, uh, the Donald Schwaben people that I had talked about, um, they're tight-knit people. They were very unique people, unique culture, a rich culture. And what they went through, nobody should go through. And throughout the country, throughout Europe, there are memorials to, to their experiences, their heartaches. And this is just a, a, a small example of, of that. Uh, the the Donald Schwaben people are their story has to be told now. I'm the last generation that has actually experienced the exodus from the ethnic cleansing. And this is one reason I coordinated well in order to tell it. Go ahead. And finally, there are proud people. They came up with their, their seal, their coat of arms, and it just shows you their pride. It, the, 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 the protection of the Black Eagle, which just goes back to Roman times, the Blue Danube, the fertile fields, the transition 
from Islam to uh, Catholicism or to Christianity. And it just shows you they have such deep-rooted appreciation for their heritage that uh, even though that generation is going away, uh, they, they, they have a, a tremendous uh, uh, love for life, for, for all the things that, that most of us cherish. And I believe with that, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be able to give you some. Okay, you... but we'll open things up for Q and A. Um, I'll probably go back and forth between our online participants and the group here. Um, and um, if you do have a question online, you'll have to unmute yourself. So just a just a heads up to that. But maybe we can go ahead and start with some questions um, from the group here in Warren. So any any questions? How old were you when you were jail Yep. Four. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just about four. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Is that Jerry Garini? Yes, Hi, Jerry. <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. As as, uh, as as a matter of fact, when I was in camp, I'm I'm Catholic. My mother was Protestant. My father was Catholic. When we were in camp, I actually was an altar boy, and uh, religion was taught in school. And it was a Catholic priest that came to class, and it didn't matter whether you were Catholic or not. You were going to sit in that class. Okay, so we were we had good religious teaching. I'm sorry. We didn't have any uh, Jewish people in our area, but I think they did in Austria. They, they did have Jewish camps where they allowed the Jewish worship. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, maybe we can go ahead and touch in the actual details as far as so that can hear. This was a question actually on on chat that I think you'll be able to, to answer. But the question was, um, why did NADC close and why didn't it survive? <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, that is a whole separate lecture, right? Philadelphia and surrounding areas have tremendous resources and engineering talent and research universities from which to draw from. I would agree with that. Was NADC lacking visibility to program offices at NAVAIR? Did funding from projects get diverted from experts to non-experts because of lack of management at NADC, not fighting hard enough to save it from BRAC? Whoa, okay, that's a loaded question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn that back to you, Franz. Well, that, that's an interesting question, and it, it's a little bit actually off topic, but I was the guy, I was the BRAC manager, and uh, some of my team members are here. I was responsible for relocating the base, and we had to do that while we stayed in business. Now, why did they close the base? Quite honestly, it's location. We were being crowded by uh, developments, and there was a place down Pax River that had more acreage that was on the Chesapeake, that had a horseback riding, that had a beach, that had several golf courses. Uh, they were closer to Washington, and I just think we could not compete with uh, with a declining budget. So, and they and they had to reduce the budget by closing some bases. And Warminster just happened to be one of those. Okay. That's kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Force forcible move. <laughs> Yeah, it was one of the hardest jobs I've ever done, by the way, and uh, I had a tremendous team 
that that executed it well. We do have an online question from uh, Rich. So Rich, go ahead and repeat the question. Hello. Uh, Brett, it's very difficult to hear online. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Mr. Bond, thanks so much for your presentation. I um, cannot believe how similar your experience has been for, uh, with my father, who is still in the area. He's 93 years old. He uh, was born and raised in Katrinefeld, Yugoslavia, German immigrants. The story is almost exactly as you put it, and um, experienced the post-war. Um, and he actually uh, escaped uh, uh, slave camps in Yugoslavia that were run by the partisans uh, with his mother and, and sister. And... Um, got on a train, they were in a camp separated, they were put together on some kind of a day and they kind of slowly trailed the party until they were totally behind them and then uh, were able to get some kind of a train, not like the, the one that you experienced, I think, but someone was able to get them tickets or so and they, I don't know how far they got on there, but they were scared to death because uh, it was a normal train as far as I understand and um, uh, they were just scared that somebody would notice that they were German. They had to get off that in two, uh, about six to nine months. And I, I like to think of it as an underground railroad. They wound up in Austria, found out that my uh, father's father, uh, my grandfather, was in Austria. He was a prisoner of war because he was one of those people who were volunteer drafted uh, in the German army. Uh, he was a prisoner of war in Russia, and they brought him back to Austria. And he was able to find him in Innsbruck, Tirolia. And uh, I think the lager there was not as harsh as the one that you lived in. But uh, the things that you mentioned are almost exactly what he's gone through his life. And I uh, appreciate you bringing that out. He's 93 right now. And he actually lives in the area in the um, uh, Christ Home uh, Community Center, uh, Retirement Center over there. Well, thank so, you thanks very again. much. By the way, I don't know if anyone recognizes Rich Mishi. Rich, you were you worked here at the base, is that correct, or was that your father? No, I did. I was the uh, one of the videographers there. Uh, I did two spells over there uh, for about two years in uh, 1979, and then I was there from about 1987 80, to 94. I was there when the uh, the, the the base closed. Yeah, and it and if any of you have interest, we've actually digitized a number of things that re Rich actually donated to the organization, and we have a number of photographs up on the website. So if you have any interest, uh, you'll have to uh, have to check those out. But uh, want to want to thank you for that. Um, yes, it was a great experience, and uh, I did manage to go to Pax River, and was there for about four years. So I actually went to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So, but I do miss the Pennsylvania area. Glad to be able to go back there uh, to visit my dad all the time. All right. Um, so this is a question from Karen Manis. Hello from the Manis family. Why isn't the ethnic cleansing of the Donna Schwaben taught in history class? That is a real good question. And I believe part of it is that most of the history is written by the victors. And uh, when, when you look at actually even the Germans, the Germans looked at the Dona Schwabens pretty much as plain people. Back, back then, uh, German was very hierarchical, okay? And, and we were kind of at the bottom, we're kind of in the, at the redneck level, you know? And I, I don't think you, you have the Dona Schwaben story told there are researchers, I mean, there are historians, but in general, that story is not told. And it's actually one of the reasons I wanted to tell it, because there's very few of us who've lived through it that 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 can tell it. Uh, I wish it was taught more. There are obviously stories of similar exodus from Latvia, from Lithuania, 
There's other countries where maybe non-Germans were, were involved. I know were involved. Uh, there, there are a lot of those stories that don't just don't get told. It's the way the way things happen after a war ends. Well, you know, your your Yugoslavia is pretty much in uh, borders on on Turkey, and when you look at the whole area of Islam influence, that had through through the various empires and the various wars. You know, when you look at the historical conflicts, different religions took over, and during the time of the Donauschwaben, it was basically a transition away from Islam and into Christianity. Uh, when, in the camp? Uh, you know, it's interesting you ask that question because for the first two years, there you you probably if you were sick bad you died okay uh things got better uh, uh, around 47 and we had access to a local town doctor uh i got to know uh, the local dentist very well um i'll give you an example i when i had a toothache and i have suffered from it since there was no such thing as drilling and getting the cavity filled, the tooth came out and no Novocaine. And I still remember the crack. That was the healthcare, okay? It got better. It got better as time went on. But the first two years after the war, now remember whole, all of Europe was in, in disarray and, and it, it affected every aspect of our lives. Our own people, our own people. There were women who, who you know, who had served that function back home, uh, but a lot of people in camp died just because the care wasn't there. And of course, you know, the food, the food part. I, I can't stress enough. When you don't eat right, uh, you don't live right, and you don't live long, and you're, you're susceptible to different diseases, different illnesses. Uh, so when you have a rough time in terms of after the war, uh, things don't go well. Anybody else? I'm, I'm very interested in language. So it's both this dialect of German. Did you also speak Croatian or any other? I, 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 that's a good question. Uh, in our school, my, my mother actually learned Serb the Serbian language in school. And she was bilingual. She, she could speak both. At home, obviously, uh, you know, German was spoken, but they they could converse with neighbors and and, and go shopping in, with the Serbian language. They spoke very little. They did a lot of beating. Okay, they very little speaking. It was things were assumed, and they acted based on the assumptions.
ship and take the trip to the mud. But the Lord has to pull in the possessions to go out and into the world. And that was them. I love that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the you know, it's interesting you say that uh, in a way what goes around comes around during World War II there was a whole bunch of refuge, uh, Ukrainian refugees that went through the same thing that we went through and here you know, almost a hundred years later the Ukrainians again are refugees, a lot of them and going through the same horrors that, that we went through yeah well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just have Antoine ask one last question. Otherwise, I think we're going to wrap up. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm delighted that we were able to bring this live and, and hybrid as well. Um, but uh, please join us next month. We will be back to just the webinar next month um, with um, our uh, guest speaker, uh, who also was an ABC alum, uh, Chuck Phillips. So looking forward to that. And thanks, everyone, again. Uh, and have a good evening. All right, take care.